In this PowerPoint, we'll discuss Le Chatelier's principle and its effect on reactions that are not at equilibrium. Le Chatelier's principle guides us in predicting qualitatively the effect that various changes in conditions might have on the position of equilibrium for a system. It says that if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, then the position of equilibrium will shift to minimize that disturbance. So let's look at a few examples. One way to disturb a system at equilibrium is to add or remove some of the reactants or products to change the concentrations. So let's look at the reaction between dinitrogen tetroxide and two molecules of nitrogen dioxide. When the system is at equilibrium, we have steady state levels for the reactants and products. Now, we're going to disturb this system, though, by adding additional NO2 to those steady state levels. According to Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction will shift to minimize this disturbance. And what that means is essentially if we add NO2, the reaction equilibrium is going to shift to consume that NO2. And, and that means, in this case, that the reverse reaction speeds up so that we consume NO2 and produce more of our reactant N2O4. And we say that the reaction shifts left in this situ situation. If we had increased the amount of N2O4, then the equilibrium would shift to reduce this added amount. So it would shift to the right, and it would favor the forward reaction. Now, these are concepts that we've already addressed or looked at through reaction quotients. Le Chatelier's principle is the qualitative understanding of what's going on. Reaction quotients, at least for concentration changes, can help us quantitatively make these same predictions. So, for example, uh, we know that in this scenario, our reaction quotient would be uh, the concentration of our NO2 squared divided by the concentration of our reactant N2O4. And at equilibrium, whatever ratio we get for a concentration of product over reactant should equal our K value, our equilibrium constant. If we are at equilibrium and then we add more NO2, what that will do is increase the value of Q above the value of K. And of course, as we've already discussed, when Q is greater than K for reaction quotient calculations, this favors the reverse process. We increase the reactants and decrease the products to get Q back to the same level as K. Now we see a similar effect when we remove reactants or products. So let's look at the same reaction, but this time we're going to remove our NO2. And thinking of this in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, to counterbalance this disturbance to our system, our reaction is going to shift to replace that NO2 that's been removed. So that implies that the forward reaction is favored. And that's exactly what happens. The reaction shifts right to replace the missing nitrogen dioxide and return the system to equilibrium. In terms of our reaction quotients, removing our product NO2 lowers the value of Q in a system that's at equilibrium so that it's now below our equilibrium constant K. And we know that when Q is less than K, it favors the forward reaction. We produce products and uh, consume reactants. So concentration is not the only thing that we can change to disturb equilibrium for a chemical reaction. For gaseous reactions, changing the volume and changing the pressure can have a significant impact on the position of equilibrium. So let's look at the gaseous reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen to produce ammonia gas. And imagine that this gaseous system is contained in a closed piston that can move up or down. So on the left-hand side, we're going to lower the piston to decrease the volume on that gaseous system. And of course, if we decrease the volume, we're also going to increase pressure. Remember that according to Boyle's law, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, 
this disturbance, the, the chemical system is going to shift to minimize this disturbance. So if we've increased the pressure, if that's our disturbance, then the chemical system will shift to decrease pressure again. And the way that it does that is by shifting towards the side of the reaction that has fewer moles of gas. And in this case, that's the product side. We have two moles of gas here associated with ammonia. On the reactant side, we actually have one plus our three moles of gas for hydrogen. So that's a total of four moles of gas. So to decrease pressure again, once it's increased, the reaction will shift to the side that has fewer moles of gas. And if we disturb it in the opposite direction, as shown here on the right hand side of the screen, if we uh, raise the piston and increase the volume, which will then decrease the pressure on those gases, the reaction will shift to the side that will result in an increase in pressure again, that will counteract that decrease. And of course, that means that it's going to shift to the side that has more moles of gas. As a result, the reverse reaction is faster and we produce more of our reactants to increase that pressure again. We can also disturb an equilibrium system by raising or lowering the temperature. So remember that our equilibrium constant K is specific to temperature. If you change the temperature, you change the equilibrium constant. The system then shifts in order to, in response to this new value of K. How the system shifts though is going to depend upon whether or not the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So remember that exothermic reactions release energy and endothermic reactions absorb energy. We can actually write heat then as a product or a reactant for these two different types of reactions. And this helps us use Le Chatelier's principle to predict the effect of temperature changes. So let's look at an example. We'll look at the synthesis of ammonia gas again. This is actually an exothermic process. So heat is released and we're going to put it on the product side as a result. Increasing the temperature of this reaction is like increasing one of the products then. That is increasing the heat content. So we increase heat, the reaction is going to shift according to Le Chatelier's principle away from this disturbance. So it's going to react to minimize it and decrease the heat. Well, going in the reverse direction allows us to consume that heat in the decomposition of ammonia gas. So the reverse process, if the forward process is exothermic, the reverse process is endothermic and will consume the heat. So for exothermic reactions, raising temperature, it actually decreases the value of our equilibrium constant K and it favors the reactants. The reaction will shift to the left. If we lower the temperature though, we lower the heat value, the reaction will shift in the opposite direction to minimize this reduction in heat. So for an exothermic reaction, lowering temperature actually increases the value of the equilibrium constant and favors the product. Now let's look at an endothermic reaction. So in this case, heat is going to be one of the reactants. So we write it on the left-hand side of the arrow. And increasing temperature, again, is going to be like adding heat. But this time, we're adding a reactant instead of a product. The net result is that, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction will shift to the product side as a result. We increase a reactant. It pushes the forward reaction. And we uh, end up increasing the products as we shift to a new equilibrium. So for an endothermic reaction, Raising temperature actually increases the value of the equilibrium constant K, and it favors the products. Decreasing temperature removes heat, and that means that we're going to shift to the left to counteract that. 
So for an endothermic reaction, lowering temperature decreases the value of K and favors the reactants. Let's look at one more change we can make to an equilibrium system. We can add a catalyst. And it turns out that adding a catalyst will affect how quickly a system reaches equilibrium, but it won't affect the actual concentration of the reactants or products at equilibrium. According to Le Chatelier's principle, what this means is that it does not affect the position of equilibrium. So remember that catalysts work by providing an alternative, more efficient mechanism for a reaction. And it does this by lowering the activation energy of the process. But consider that a catalyzed process has both a forward and a reverse direction associated with it. So there's activation energy associated with both of these processes. But that activation energy, when it's lowered for a catalyst, it's lowered for both the forward and the reverse reaction. And this means that the catalyst actually affects the rate of the forward and reverse reactions equally. One reaction won't be favored over the other, and the position of the equilibrium will not shift. It will reach equilibrium more quickly, but the concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium will be the same. Let's look at an example of how we can use Le Chatelier's principle to predict the effect that different changes will have on an equilibrium system. So the system we'll look at is the synthesis of sulfur trioxide gas from sulfur dioxide and oxygen. All right, so this process has a negative enthalpy, that's our delta H value, of negative 198 kilojoules per mole. The negative sign indicates that heat is released, so this is an exothermic process. So we'll go ahead and add heat to our product side. And let's start by predicting how the concentrations will change if we add more oxygen to our equilibrium system. So increasing one of our reactants, Le Chatelier's principle says that uh, the position of equilibrium will shift to minimize this increase. And that means that the forward reaction, which consumes O2, will be favored. And we will end up, in the end, producing more sulfur trioxide. If we remove sulfur trioxide, we get a similar effect. So now we're removing our product. Again, the equilibrium position will shift to replace that lost product. So the forward reaction again will be favored so that we can produce more SO3. And we say that the reaction shifts to the products. All right, next, let's compress our reaction container. So compressing the gases has the same effect as increasing the pressure. And of course, we know that this means that the system will respond by trying to decrease the pressure again. And it will do that by shifting to the side of the reaction that has fewer moles of gas. So on the reactant side, we have two moles from the SO2 plus, can't draw a plus sign, plus one mole of O2 which gives us three moles total for the reactant side. On the product side, we have just two moles of the sulfur trioxide. So if we increase pressure, the reaction is going to shift to the product side because there are fewer moles of gas there. Now let's cool the container. So this means that we're lowering the temperature. which is the same as removing heat. And of course, to counteract this loss of heat, the reaction will shift so that it can produce more heat again. So the reaction again shifts to the product side. All right, now let's go in the opposite direction and double the volume of the container. This, of course, means that we are reducing pressure so the reaction shifts to the side that has more moles of gas. 
and that's the reactant side, with three moles total. So this time we say we shift to the reactants, or shift to sulfur dioxide and oxygen gas. Next, let's warm the mixture. So this is increasing the temperature. That's increasing heat. And again, to counterbalance this extra heat, we consume it in the reverse reaction. So we again shift to the reactants, SO2 and O2. And finally, let's add a catalyst. And as you know, adding a catalyst will mean that we get to our final equilibrium position more quickly, but it doesn't actually change the position. We still have the same concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium.